to end, but I will have my office hours tomorrow in the morning. Um, if those don't work and you still have um, some remaining questions, um, uh, please email me. Uh, uh, I'm happy to set a time to maybe have, have other conversations about it, even over the weekend if need be. Um, I can have, um, I can set up a group on uh, like Google Plus and we can do a hangout if you want to chat. Um, about that. So just send me an email ahead of time if, if you do want to do it, you can't make my office hours. But um, um, yeah, so um, okay, so uh, the, 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 just to reiterate, there is a four page limit per student, and um, you know, this is also single column 11 points, so don't try and squeeze too much in. If you squeeze too much in, I'm not going to enjoy reading as much, and I'll be in the worst mood. And, <laughs> so, you know, the point of this is to make it um, convenient for me to understand what you did, right? Um, so, so it's four pages per student, um, and you and you don't have to fill up all the space. If you can describe everything you want in a small amount of space, that's great. Um, so I I don't expect it to necessarily fill up all the pages, and you can you can. Um, you know, doing charts and plots is good. Those should be inside the four pages. Um, you can put more stuff in the appendix if you want to find, but um, no promises I'll actually read that, right? So anything about the content needs to be in the four pages. Right? If, if there's something that you needed to tell me and it doesn't and you put in the appendix, then it's not going to count towards what I'm expecting to see. Okay, so writing concisely is a skill and you know, um, I know this is an English class, but you still need to work on it. It's part of the whole kind of package. Um, okay, so um, then what should go in the content, right? So, you know, I'll start by explaining the poem. Don't assume I remember exactly what you wrote in the proposal and the data collection report and, and the intermediate report. You can reuse the text, that's fine, but you know, there are 15, 20 projects in here, and I don't remember all the details of everyone's. Um, so please, you know, re-explain the problem, and re-explain the data, and what you're planning to do with it. Um, and so, then, then the main part um, that I'm hoping to see is some sort of key idea, right? This key idea can be you took an existing technique and you modified it in some way so it worked on this data set, or so it worked better in general, you, or you you said, I have this data, I want to analyze it, I'm going to try um, a few of these different techniques and I'm going to see how they compare. And then once you've, you have this key idea, then you need to explain to me what you did. Right? So it's, you have to say, I ran these experiments, here are the output of the results. Don't just show a chart, but explain what's in the chart. And then say, how well did this do? Right? It's okay if if you tried something that was well reasoned but it didn't end up working, as long as you explain why you think it didn't work, what you learned from the process. Otherwise, if it didn't work, explain why it worked and why you think it'll work on if you tried a different data set. Right? So, so I want to kind of get, so I want to understand what was the problem, how do you approach it, and what were the ideas you were using from class on how to approach it, and then how well do you think it worked. And so, you know, in the end, if you if you learn something from this, like I tried these these three clustering approaches, and this one happened to work better, and here's what I think why, then um, then this is great, right? If you say I, I tried this idea I had we learned from class on this real data, and it didn't work like I expected. It worked a little bit differently, and I had to modify this. I learned this about real data. That's what I'm hoping to do with the project. When you have data from from like uh, if it's if it's data from a homework assignment, you know, um, probably what happened is me and Yan spent some time cleaning up the, that data, so, so it ended up producing a nice result, and it came out clean. It was already prepared, but in here you have to kind of do some of this yourself, and there are different challenges you'll face, and so that's what I want you to do. Um, that's what I want you to get out of it. So if you can demonstrate you got that out of it. Explaining um, how you did it with some techniques from class, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so, um, so up until now, on the project, you know, I was grading based on 
um, what the procedure was, right? Did you follow the instructions? Were you making progress? So up to this point, so here I'm, I'm, I'm going to grade a little bit, um, some fraction of the points are going to be, you know, um, like um, how well did you execute what you're planning to do, right? So I, and, I, and I understand that some of the data challenges some people had were more than other people, and so, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you had to spend more time lunging with, with the data, then I'm not going to expect as much on the, on the analysis, on, a, on the in-depth analysis. If, you, if your data was not as, as difficult and you're able to get clean data at the start, then I probably will expect a little bit more from the analysis. So I'm not saying I'm, I'm still happy to give everyone A's and 100% you know, on here, but but it's not going to be just the, so some part of it may be more, you know, how well did you actually execute it. Um, but I'll try to be, you know, as fair as possible. So, um, and so, I, you know, I think part of the, the, the important part of, of, of learning is, is me giving you feedback and then you actually looking at that feedback. Um, so if I take off points, I'm going to give you, I'll allow you to earn back up to up to half of the points that I took off. Um, if, you, if I give you specific feedback, and you follow it and turn something back in? Um, so, so I mean, hopefully you all do well, and I don't have to take off points. You don't have to do this or whatever. But, but you know, if if I think you didn't quite do something correctly, I'll try and give you a chance to make that. Um, and then after this, we'll talk about. Um, so we're going to do some posters afterwards on the last day, on the last day or the so sometime around the end of classes, which we'll get to see what everyone else is working on, and that should be a lot. Better. So hopefully that won't be too much work after the project. Um, so, uh, but we'll talk about that after after all the reports are done. Um, so does anyone have, have any any questions on on the reports or what I'm expecting? Okay, great. So if you have any questions, and, you know, if you don't have questions now, but you let some come up, um, please, you know, see me in my office hours or send an email and either I can answer stuff over email or we can uh, um, find another way to, um, to chat and figure out what's um, to, to, uh, to clear up your confusion. Okay, let's see if I can do this correctly. Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, Markov chains. So, so who's heard of Markov chain? Of a Markov chain? And who has not heard of a Markov chain? And, and who didn't raise their hand? This number has never had up so <laughs> Is it just you or does this happen in all your classes? In all of them? All right. Um, uh, Markov chain. So, um, so even if you've heard of Markov chains, hopefully it'll give you a different perspective on them. So I think uh, the reason I'm spending a lecture is a lot of, I, uh, um, at least I believe, the, kind of the right way to think about graphs and the analysis of graphs, which will be kind of the rest of the class, is through the view of a Markov chain. And you won't always use it directly, um, but you'll use um, new intuition from the Markov chain. And, and sometimes we'll look at a technique and then we'll say, oh yeah, that was actually analyzing it in a certain way that was related how a Markov chain would work. Um, so this is a, it's a, it's a really important um, tool. And, and there really are multiple ways to think of Markov chains. Um, and uh, so, so you can define them on ways more general than graphs. And so, um, so, so, so basically in the lecture today, I will, um, the plan is to, um, define Markov chains. Um, so there's um, then there. Uh, 
Um, then there's an important definition. Um, um, of this term ergodic, and we'll talk about what it means for a Markov chain to be ergodic. And th this, this is it's kind of a definition that, that was developed um, over, over a few, um, over time, and kind of combines a bunch of properties in kind of a clean way. And if this is satisfied, then, then a lot of nice stuff happens. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about this and how to, how to think about this property. Um, and then, um, um, and then we'll talk about one application. Um, <coughs> um, one application of Markov chains called the Metropolis algorithm. Um, so who's heard of the Metropolis algorithm? Um, so who's heard of uh, um, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo? So the Metropolis algorithm is basically the same thing as that. So there's the Markov chain Monte Carlo is sometimes called the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Um, the original version is called the Metropolis algorithm. And uh, <clears throat> um, so we'll talk about that. And then so th there, as, I, as I mentioned, there, there, there are multiple ways to think about uh, Markov chains. And there, there are two kind of main dual ways to think about it. And one of them will correspond with the Metropolis algorithm. The other one will correspond with PageRank. And so next week, Monday, the topic will be PageRank. And we'll talk about that view of Markov chains. Um, and you know, if, if you know anything about the PageRank algorithm already, it's really just analyzing um, the entire web as a big Markov chain. But then you have to figure out how to kind of model this and do the computation on it. And then later, we'll We'll talk about how you actually do large-scale computation to, to, um, to actually run the page rank algorithm. And so this background on Markov chains will be really important in understanding. All right, so, um, so, so, um, so kind of a fun thing, I, I thought that I would try and teach you um, three life lessons um, from Markov chains. Um, and maybe this is a stretch, but maybe there, there are fun ways of thinking about um, on what's going on. So, um, so, so the, the, the first thing is only your um, current position matters. Um, this is the same thing as don't worry about the past. Only worry about where you are now and where you can go forward. And so, so if you know Markov chains, you know this is has, has to do with the Markov part of Markov chains, right? Um, and I'll try and kind of come back to these throughout the lectures. Uh, um, uh, so um, um, take one step at a time. Um, you will eventually uh, um, get there. All right, so, so, so just worry about doing one thing at a time, and you'll eventually get where you're supposed to go. And we'll explain what, um, yes. uh, what you're supposed to go means. Or, and then um, the third thing is that um, In the limit, um, everyone has um, perfect um, karma. Um, so what goes around comes around, and we'll see that. Okay, so this, so so maybe these don't make any sense right now, but hopefully by the end of the lecture, everything here will make sense. See a lot of confused looks, but that's probably good. Um, um, that, um, um, so hopefully that means you'll learn something. So, um, all right. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about this in the context of uh, um, in the context of graphs. So I drew up here this example of graph that I like to use, or I don't know if it's exactly the same thing I used before, or it's something something different. But this is our graph. We have these eight nodes 
a pair, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And uh, you can think of the graph by this, um, you can think of it by this matrix. Um, this is the adjacency matrix. There's a zero if there's no edge between C and B. There's no edge there, so there's a zero, and there's a one if there is an edge. Between A and D, there's an edge that corresponds to one. And this graph is undirected, um, which guarantees that the adjacency matrix will be um, symmetric. If it is directed, then that means that you can only, if the edge from A to D was only in this direction from A to D, that means that if you're at A, you can go to D, but maybe if you're at D, you can't go to A, so maybe this would be a zero. Okay, so we'll talk about, I'll give some examples of directed graphs later um, in order to illustrate some things. Okay, um, so, so everyone remembers graphs, hopefully. Um, okay, um, um, so now a Markov chain is going to be, um, so if we have this, just remember a, a graph is the set of nodes and edges. Um, um, so a Markov chain is <coughs> going to be a set of nodes, a matrix P, which is going to correspond with the edges somehow, and a starting state Q. Okay, so let me, let me explain what these are. And sometimes this Q is, is not needed. And some things about markup chains, you don't need to know what Q is. Um, so we can we can sometimes sometimes ignore this, um, but not always. So um, all right. So um, so V is the set of nodes, right? So you can think of these as, as the nodes of the graph. Um, and so it means it, um, basically exactly what you, what you think it is. You, are, um, you have a set of, so okay, so a Markov chain is kind of like there's a set of places you can be. So I can be at one of the nodes on the graph. All right, so, so then, um, so if I'm at node F, then, then this is one of the places I can be. Now, more generally, the set of nodes could be something um, that's continuous. So I could be somewhere in this room. And every possible location is describing one of the states. So this, this could be a set, a continuous set of states. And I'll come back and give some examples of this later. Um, but this could just be, be a bit more general. But it's easier to think of it in terms of in terms of graphs. Okay. So now P is going to be the probability um, of transition. Matrix. So this is going to describe the probability that if I'm at a particular state, after I take, I'm going to take one step, and they'll describe the probability that I'm at another state. So it's going to tell me the transition from one state to the next. So, and I'm going to get it out of this adjacency matrix. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's going to be, it's, this is again a matrix, Right? But this, in order for it to be a probability adjacency matrix, it has the property that um, each, um, each column um, um, has a um, total uh, states this way. Each column, PJ, um, has two properties. Um, each pji is greater or equal to zero. So each entry is, it, um, is greater than zero, it can't be negative. Um, and, and so the sum over i of pji is equal to one. And this is true for all j. This is true for all i and for all j. Right, so if, if I look at a column, and I sum up all the entries, it has to be equal to one exactly. And so this is equal to, and it has to be greater or equal to zero. Right, so, um, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll define the, the state, and then I'll come back and explain why this makes sense. Uh, 
But you can also have that each row has it or each column, so it's like left and right. Yeah, right. So it depends on. And then if row and column both sum up, then it's fully. Uh, there's a word for it. Yeah, there is. I, I don't remember the word for it. Um, so that's for me, it's what else remembers. But the, 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 there's another word for. Stochastic. Ah, uh, stochastic, yes. So yeah. it's rightly stochastic, left stochastic, or fully stochastic if the rows and columns. Right. So this can be any, right? It doesn't have to be column. It can be rows as well. Um, it could be rows, but it's it's enough for what we'll talk about for it to be rows. Um, so there, there there are more general things you can say. There's there's a huge theory on um, on this huge theory of markup chains, and we'll just touch on this parts um, on that I think are most relevant for the class. At some point when I was an undergrad, I took an entire class just on, on our budget. So, um, although apparently I don't remember quite everything from it. But, um, um, that was a long time ago. Okay, so, okay. so um, the final thing is Q is the initial state. So this describes, this is a starting kind of think of it as a starting point of where you are in the state space, in this, um, um, in this V, this set of um, So here, <coughs> as an example, if we are, um, um, so if we're at, let's see, if we're at F, um, then we're going to have that Q is going to be equal um, to a vector where I say I'm at f, so I have a 1, which corresponds to the, uh, the sixth element, and I have a 0 everywhere else. OK? Um, so, it, but a, a state can also be more general. Um, you can also say, I don't know exactly where I am. I, I might be at several possible locations, and I have a probability that I'm at a location. Right? So, um, um, so another example would be that, um, let's see, I'm at, uh, let's see, I'm at A um, with, um, with probability um, 1 over 10. I'm at C um, with probability um, 3 over 10. <coughs> And I'm at, uh, let's say, H with probability. Of a, maybe I have an example I want to use. Uh, well, okay, I'll just do that over here. Um, and I'm at H with probably um, 6 over 10, right? So I could be at these. I have some probability I'm at these states, and then I'm at every other state with probability zero. Right? So then what is this? This is going to cause Q to be equal to, let's see, 1 over 10 at A, 0 at B, 3 over 10 at C, 0 at D, 0 at E, 0 at F, 0 at G, and 6 over 10 at H. Right? So I can represent the probability of where I am in this as this vector. Okay? Alright, so now let's see what happens when I combine an initial state with this probability transition matrix. Okay? Um, so, so actually I'm going to use this initial state to be slightly different so I have this worked out ahead of time. So I'm going to say I'm at B. I'm necessarily at B as my initial state. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to use this as my initial state. And now I'm going to consider a probability transition matrix that's made out of this matrix here. Right. So I'm going to say that if I'm at, I'm going to define the transition to say if I'm at a certain node, I can jump to any of its neighbors. Any of the edges is connected on with equal probability. Okay, so if I convert 
this matrix, this adjacency matrix into a probability transition matrix, then I'm going to get, uh, hopefully this won't take too long, um, 0, 1 third, 1 third, third 0, 0, 0, 0, um, 1 half, 0, 0, 1 half. For C, I have three possible things. Uh, for D. Uh, for D. Am I doing okay so far? All right, so sorry if this is a little slow. And for F. So if I made mistakes, hopefully in the notes it's correct. Um, if I made mistakes in the notes, please let me know. Um, if I made mistakes here, you can let me know. So, okay, so now I'm going to start with this initial state. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this probability transition matrix. So that means that I'm going to get a state, um, a new state Q1 is equal to this applying this probability transition matrix to my, um, to my initial state, right? And the output is going to be, let's see, let's see what happens. So I'm gonna start with here with, with this, this state, and uh, I'm at state B, and so if I, if I do this thing, I'm taking essentially the, the um, I'm distributing this probability over the places where B can go, right? And so one half the time is gonna to go to A, and one half the time it's going to go to D, right? So if I'm at B, half the time I'm going to go to A, half the time to D, and there's no place else I can go. So that means my output is one half, zero, zero, one half, zero, 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 zero. right? So, so this, this column tells me where I'm going to go next if I'm at D, or this, you know, if I look at the, Whatever the column label, it tells you where you're going to go next if you are there. Okay, so now I can say, well, I, I might be at A and I might be at D if I'm in, after one step. So let's see what happens if I'm instead, um, if instead now I want to look at state Q2, which is equal to P times state Q1. Okay. And, uh, and so, so, so I can write this down here. And uh, so let's see, half the time if I'm at A, I'm going to wind up a third of the time at B, C, or D. And half the time if I'm at D would be a third of the time at A, B, or, or C. Right? So that means that one sixth of the time I'm going to be at A, one third at B, one third at C, and one sixth at D. Does that make sense? So if I started at B and I took two steps, I could either, the first step I'm either at A or D with equal probability, and then I can either jump from D over to A, or from A over to D, or up to C or B. And I'm more likely to be at B or C than I am at A or D, is what it's saying. Because there are two ways I can get to C. There's only one way I can get to A and one way I can get to D. There are two ways I can get back to D. Okay? Alright, so uh, do you want to do one more step? Uh, so, so if I do one more step, then Q3. 
is going to be, let's see, let me just look at my notes. still zero probability I'm at F, G, or H, because in three steps, there's no way I can get over there. Right? But if I keep making steps, eventually I'll solve probability of being over in this part of the graph. Okay. Um, all right. So, so what are, um, so a couple things to see here is that to get to state Q, I can write it as Q1 times P. I can also write Q2 as P times P times Q. Oh. Right? So you can you can apply the, so you know, this is just by replacing the definition of Q1 here with P times Q. Right? And so also Q3 is equal to P times P times P times Q. And so in general, you can write this as <coughs> P squared times q, and this is equal to p to the third times q. Right, so you can think of squaring a matrix the same way you square a regular number, and that's by just applying it to itself a bunch of times. Um, okay, so uh, uh, where are we with respect to our, uh, with respect to our life goals? Um, or these life lessons, whatever they are. So um, the first thing is only the current position matters. So what we're doing, we're only looking at where we currently are, and we're taking one step forward. And so we can get to Q3 by just remembering, um, just remembering Q2. Right? I had Q3 equals P times Q2. Now I could have gone all the way back to Q, but I can erase all that and capture the state in Q2, and that describes the third state. Um, so in general, we're going to have that the state QI is equal to, or say QI plus 1 is equal to P times QI. So I can always move one state forward by just looking at the previous state. And this probability transition matrix is, is what is, is, um, is describing how I transition from one state to the next. And so now it's a good time to look back at these two conditions I had on the probability transition matrix. So the first one is that the value is always zero. I never, because it's a probability of transitioning, a probability has to be has to be greater than zero. I can't have a negative probability of doing something. Um, that doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, and that they sum up to one is mean that I can't. Um, um, I can't just disappear into the ether, right? I have to go somewhere, right? So this says they sum up to one. There, the probability of all the possible steps I make has, has to be a probability. It has to sum to one. So, so that's why I normalize these columns this way. Um, okay. So, so this, if you're not familiar, this Markov part of Markov chains. Um, this comes from Andrei Markov and. He was a, a famous mathematician, I guess, in the early 1900s, maybe, in the late 1800s, maybe. And so he, one of the things he talked about was a Markov process, which is a process that you only care about your current state. And you only, you know, you, from everything in your current state, you can tell what you're going to do next going forward. And so a Markov chain is a, is a, is, is a type of Markov process. And in, in fact, the chain is because you're chaining together the series of states. You're looking at one state, you take a step, 
then you're at another stage, you take another step. And so you're applying these Markov steps from one step at a time over and over again. Right? So, so only the current state matters and everything in the future. It doesn't matter where you came from, it just matters where you are now. Now, um, we're going to talk a little bit. Okay, yeah. So, um, um, so in general, so I'm gonna we're going to talk about a um, a um, some state qn, and I can write this as p to the n q. Right, so this is the state after n steps. And I know the initial state, and I know this is the state after n steps. And I can write p to the n for any value n, and, and I can get that, right? So this is equivalent to um, p times q to the n minus 1, right, based on this formula. Okay, so, um, so a little bit later we'll talk about um, a little bit about the properties of this. But, Yeah, need to, I need some more definitions first. Okay, so now there there are two there are two general ways to think of a Markov chain. Um, let's see. So, so um, so there are two interpretations. The first one is that um, you are um, always at one's um, one node, right? So the state always looks like this one. You're always at one location, and at every time you you do a step, you actually choose randomly and you move to one new location. Now it's a random process, so you don't know where it's going to be, but you're always at one location, right? So so always at one node, and the the other way is that you. Um, track of um, the distribution. So the other way is, is, is like I described in this example, where I said after three steps, here's the distribution of where I might be. So, so I don't keep track of an individual state where I am. I keep track of the distribution of where I might be. And these two different interpretations lead to two different algorithms. So this first